All right, we're, we'll try this again. Play musical chairs over there. All right, so the focus of this is going to be really to uh, discuss adjuvant therapy. We talked a little bit about neoadjuvant therapy last night, so we won't, uh, we won't cover that. So this is actually a case, but what I've done is I've included some permutations of this case to try and elicit some, uh, some, some questions and ideas. So this is a 53-year-old man with Gleason grade, 4 plus 3 disease, uh, pretty high volume and involved 8 out of 12 cores. His PSA was 7. He had a multi-parametric MRI and had a PIRAD5 uh, lesion at the left apex with some bulging of the capsule suggesting that he might have extra capsular extension, although there was no gross extra capsular extension noted. He had traditional metastatic evaluation with just a traditional bone scan, which was negative. Uh, the nodes looked negative on his MRI. He elected surgery over radiation and hormonal therapy in this case. Um, and the final pathology was Gleason grade uh, 4 plus 3 with tertiary grade 5. So the first uh, kind of permutation of this case is that the patient had extra capsular extension and had a positive margin, but he did have a fairly extended no dissection uh, and, and those were negative. So, so that brings up the questions. Uh, so this is a man with basically T3 disease, positive margin, high grade, um, you know, and, and the traditional question of radiation, whether adjuvant or, or salvage. So, why don't we start actually with, uh, with one of the surgeons. How about Lenny? Uh, just kind of discuss your thoughts on this. So, you know, where we are today is we rely on standard pathology and uh, we have ASTRO AUA guidelines, which would state that this gentleman uh, should have a discussion about the utilization of uh, adjuvant radiation therapy. I think most of the data is fairly compelling. Uh, that if you wait for the PSA to rise, your salvage rate is going to go down dramatically. If you treat early before the PSA begins to become detectable, you have your best chance. So I would say this gentleman should have a discussion about the risk and benefits of adjuvant radiation, and I think you should be encouraged to consider local radiation therapy. Yes, go ahead. Mark. We uh, typically have this kind of discussion with the, the patient. Um, there is, as we know, no consensus. We have three randomized trials showing that uh, immediate uh, radiation is better than delayed, but delayed to a level which, we, which was not well, well uh, established. So the type of discussion we have with our patients is to tell them that Clearly, they have a high risk to recur at some point that we have a PSA elevation, probably in a setting like that, something around the 50%. And the earlier they will get the radiation, the better it will be. Now, I'm impressed by the Christopher King data from UCLA that he tried to take all the trials, you know, showing that the earlier you uh, give the radiation, the better it is with a threshold at 0 0.2, 0 0.5, 0 0.6, wherever you put the threshold, it's there. So it's a continuous variable. That's what we try to uh, explain to our patients. And it's an about 2.6 in Christopher King data percent of uh, increased failure uh, for each increment of 0.1 uh, nanogram per milliliter in the PSA. Now, for a patient like that, I would tell him you have an about 50% chance not to need radiation at all. So you can certainly wait uh, to some uh, uh, rise of the PSA. And if you wait until 0.1 with very sensitive 0.2, at most you will decrease your chance by, by 3, 4, or 5%. So you make the choice wh where, where it is. I typically don't tend to treat all those patients, despite the fact that I believe the earlier the better, I think we can wait in a setting like uh, that. But, you know, some patients don't want also to have the psychological burden of waiting, and some of them are anyhow after the surgery impotent. The radiation is, frankly speaking, quite well tolerated, so some of them will opt for radiation. So uh, does it make a difference to any of you whether or not the patient had positive margins or negative margins in this case with, uh, with a high-risk tumor? in terms of your recommendation from the surgeon side, then we'll get the, uh, the radiation oncologist side. So I think, yeah, I mean, I think that's more uh, 
certainly more uh, ominous for uh, the patients with the uh, positive, gross positive margins. Uh, the other thing, we alluded to this a little bit earlier, looking at things like the Decipher test. We have some data that's in press right now showing that you can use a genomic classifier to actually determine who's going to have a favorable response and a non-favorable response. It's only in about 230 patients, but it's a suggestion of how uh, genomic classification may help us decide, avoid over-treatment, because I agree some of, many of these patients are going to be over-treated. We just don't know at this point which one will be over-treated. So which way does that go? If the decipher says that they've got high risk of metastasis, are those patients who'd radiate or say they've got high risk of metastasis and not radiate? It's, it's recur Our study was different than the, the uh, decipher that was referred to earlier about metastasis. It concerns responsiveness to salvage radiation therapy. Okay. All right. So let's move on. So, so Howard, the, uh, the, the newer question, so that's the old questions, adjuvant versus salvage. The new question is, what's the data in terms of and who would you integrate uh, hormonal therapy in the adjuvant or salvage setting, and how would you do it? Um, thanks, Rob. The um, um, integration of hormonal therapy with radiation is something that we have a lot of experience with, except in the post-operative setting, where we don't have much experience. Uh, we, we're currently randomizing patients to hormone therapy or not in the US on an RTOG study in the salvage setting. Um, and um, in the UK, um, there's a large study looking at, adju looking at uh, adjuvant hormonal therapy in the um, both adjuvant and salvage setting. So there will be phase three data. Um, those, those trials are both accruing well. So there will be data that will inform that decision. Uh, off study, outside of a clinical trial, um, I don't use hormone therapy in the uh, adjuvant setting unless patients have positive lymph nodes. Um, and I do use it um, off study in the salvage setting for a detectable PSA when it's greater than uh, 1.0 at the time of radiation therapy. Um, Dr. Vigoda talked about treating patients at 0.1 or 0.2, which I think is better than treating them at 1.0 or, or higher. But in the US, I still see many patients who are referred for salvage radiation therapy when the PSA is 1, 2, 2.5, and uh, those patients, I um, off-study give them short-term androgen deprivation. So yeah, we're gonna we'll, we'll get that to that a little bit. Uh, any other comments, Daniel? Evan, Cora, I'm gonna get to you. Don't worry. <laughs> any other comments? No, I, I just want, want, to, want to add that uh, our concern regarding immediate radiation to these patients is also regarding the function, the urinary function. So you usually ask the patient to wait wait a little bit, at least six months, to improve. Uh, the uh, urinary continence before uh, introducing radiation to these patients. Also, the fact that uh, most of the data on uh, adjuvant uh, androgen deprivation with radiation uh, is uh, basically retrospective data, didn't show any survival benefit uh, uh, comparing to radiation alone. So, we usually re don't recommend a routine adjuvant uh, uh, androgen blockage with radiation in these patients. So uh, kind of a second permutation of the same case is that the patient actually underwent surgery. He had uh, actually, in this case, he had T2 disease, but he actually did have one positive node. So uh, I think David Crawford was uh, touching on this subject earlier. So in this case, with a single positive node, uh, his metastatic evaluation, at least heretofore, had been negative. Uh, so first of all, are there any other tests that you would order at this point? Uh, Cora, anybody? before you make a decision on therapy? I, I don't have tests available in Italy that I could order at, at the moment on, on this patient with one positive node. Um, I think that in a patient, the other patient, I definitely would have radiated at a time before, tried to find the balance be, before um, the PSA was 0.2, and after he, wa he wasn't going to be frozen in the state of incontinence, so you'd have to find somewhere in that stage. In this patient, in the past, I think we would have given uh, hormonal therapy dumbbell to everyone, but I think that right now, I think that we have a level of caution, and I would watch this patient for a minute and see what happens with his PSA before I would just give him uh, therapy. So is there anybody that you would automatically, based on the messing study, and you know, give hormonal therapy to 
immediately in the setting if he had uh, more than a single node? Is there any you know, disease burden uh, or anything that would uh, sway you to use kind of very early hormonal therapy in the setting prior to getting a PSA or irrespective of it? It's possible that this patient only has one positive node and it was removed. At the ASCO meeting, it presented capture data based on, uh, uh, it's retrospective, but based on 14,000 charts and 7,000 uh, patients who had uh, definitive either radiation or um, uh, prostatectomy, 2,000 patients had rising PSA. And they looked uh, retrospectively in longitudinal observational study of patients who um, had immediate uh, hormonal therapy versus those who they waited at least two years or at the time of recurrence. And there was absolutely no difference in overall survival or prostate cancer survival. So I think that what we did in the past was, you know, giving hormonal therapy, radiating, doing, I think we overdid it a little bit with these patients. Mark? Well, um, I, I would uh, maybe take the counterpoint that a patient that had uh, significant disease already on the biopsies was eight after, uh, out of uh, 12 uh, positive cores with less than seven tertiary pattern five, has had probably quite significant, we don't have the pathology, you didn't get, give us the pathology of the, the prostate, probably quite significant disease in the prostate. This patient has one out of 15 nodes which is positive. I think this patient is clearly a patient at uh, a significant risk of eventual uh, recurrence. Uh, should he then recur, it will be difficult to, to, uh, to salvage him. Uh, he can recur not only the prostatic bed, but maybe also in the nodes. I happen to believe that uh, nodal disease, as the surgeon say today, is a potentially still curable disease by radiation uh, also, so this patient has a high risk to recur. Uh, I'm also unclear about the validity of one out of 50 nodes. We they had today data about extended uh, lymph node dissection, so I don't know which were the, the real nodes which were removed. I think the patient should be aware that he has a significant risk to recur. Based on that, I would personally uh, recommend to give him adjuvant treatment. The treatment we would give him in a setting like that would be radiation and probably some form of hormones, recognizing that we yet uh, are lacking the, the prospective studies on that. Uh, so if you were going to use hormones, would you, well, let's say that patient actually, the PSA became, was detectable. Would you use intermittent hormones, Cora, or would you use continuous? in this uh, type of setting where the only metastatic disease was a single lymph node. Just, just to finish for this patient, yeah. I, I wouldn't treat it based on the Messing uh, study. I would just use the, the hormones as a sensitizer and adjunct to the, to, the, to the radiation. I would give it probably for one to two uh, years in a setting like that, again in the, in the lack of, of prospective studies. I just don't know. I would give it indef indefinitely. So you're asking me whether or not to give um, intermittent hormones. Right. I think this is the kind of patient that when you start hormones, you have to see what happens with his PSA. If his P and uh, the PSA becomes, I mean, I wouldn't give it until his PSA rises, so there's a clinical reason to give it, first of all. And then if he's on uh, hormonal therapy for a while and the PSA is zero, 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 I would definitely consider this as a patient for intermittent. The thing with intermittent is that there are di really different criteria, and I look at many of the American studies, and they stop uh, the hormone therapies and put patients on intermittent therapy when PSAs are 4 and 7, and they don't start again until they're 10 or 20. And I, I can tell you that in Italy, the level of anxiety of the doctors and the patients and everyone that doesn't allow us to wait until 10 or 20. We, we do intermittent therapy. I, I, I'm a great proponent of it, but I think we do it at, at lower levels of PSA. Thanks. Uh, Howard, do you want to comment on radiating the nodes in, in this type of setting when you only, you know, at least have evidence of a single node being positive? Yeah, thanks, Rob. Um, first of all, this is a very unusual case in that one, uh, there were lymph nodes positive, but he's PT2 with negative margins. Almost all the time, these patients have an indication for adjuvant radiation therapy at the primary site, either PT3 or positive surgical margins or seminal vesicle invasion. Um, so um, um, given that it's a very unusual case, um, in general, most of the time when there's lymph nodes positive, I find a reason to treat the primary. And if lymph nodes are positive, I treat the uh, regional lymphatics as well. And I consider that to be kind of a soft recommendation. Um, I think the level one evidence favors the hormonal therapy, uh, but I add radiation therapy uh, based on some retrospective data, 
um, a study from Briganti from Italy suggesting a, a benefit to radiation uh, in this setting. I'm going to, because uh, in the interest of time, I'm going to just kind of go on and finish the case. So actually what really happened to this man is he had, he had this high-risk disease. He actually had, uh, he had extra capture extension but had negative margins and, his, uh, and he had no lymph nodes positive with an extended node dissection. However, three months after surgery, he elected not to get uh, immediate adjuvant radiation therapy. His PSA was detectable at 0 0.25. And so... Uh, we actually have the ability to do uh, PET scans, which are available in a number of places. We use C11 acetate or C11 choline, F18 choline. Uh, and in fact, he had uh, a number of nodes positive, but one of the nodes is here. He had an interaortal cable uh, node that kind of lit up with the C11 acetate scan. So he actually now, with a PSA of 0 0.25, which is actually fairly rare uh, to actually see the metastases, but he had a number of lymph nodes really outside the, uh, the usual area where you would radiate. So that brings up a number of questions, which is kind of what's, what, is, what is the evidence for radiating lymph nodes uh, when you don't have this type of evidence, knowing that these occult lymph nodes may well be present in a substantial percentage of these patients? Howard, do you want to comment on that? And then we'll get to a kind of a therapy question and finish up. Um, I mean, it's an interesting um, case because of this. And it's a little unusual, I think, for a PSA of 0.25 to have a, a C11, a true positive C11 node. So um, I might investigate a little bit further. These patients are of an age where they can have um, low-grade lymphomas and a, a lot of enlarged lymph nodes may be not prostate cancer related. But assuming this is uh, prostate cancer, which I think happens uh, in a in a relatively small percentage of uh, cases with a given uh, scenario. Um, in, you know, in my optimistic radiation oncology mind, I, I think, well, you know, this is targeting. There's biochemical evidence of disease. Why not target the targetable disease with radiation therapy as a, as a treatment approach? And um, occasionally I will be driven to do something along those lines purely as an optimistic oncologist. Yeah. I mean, I think we could have a discussion about that because with better and better imaging, we're seeing more and more metastases. We're realizing our sensitivity for detection, even at these low PSAs, is really quite poor. So I, I think that's going to be a question that needs to be addressed. Um, but I think the final thing I wanted to uh, raise with this question, so now this patient actually has demonstrable metastatic disease. He's still, quote, unquote, androgen sensitive. Uh, as you know, there was an ASCO, at ASCO there was a report of uh, finally results of a, a chemo, a taxotere plus uh, androgen, androgen deprivation study, so a pretty remarkable improvement in survival. Is this somebody that you would consider for, uh, for chemo in this setting or just uh, standard primary hormonal therapy to all of you? I, I can handle this. So at ASCO, um, Sweeney presented the results of an ECOG SWOG trial in which they took patients with widely metastatic disease and treated them, they were hormone naive, with the combination of either hormonal therapy or uh, hormonal therapy, androgen blockade plus um, uh, taxoter chemotherapy. And what they saw that's clear is in the patients who have widely metastatic disease, what they call high risk, which means more than four um, bony lesions, one of which has to be outside of the um, the, the, the axial, skele axial skeleton, in a in perpendicular, the arms or the legs, or visceral disease, there was an improvement in survival of 17 months. Okay, the follow-up in this study is 29 months, and when they put together the patients that are low risk, that weren't any of these high risk features, I think that the follow-up was not so, so long. The, altogether, there was a, a, an overall survival benefit of 14 months, but that the patients, um, when you take out the group of the, the low risk patients not having that definition of high risk, I don't think the evidence are that clear to give um, patients chemo and hormonal therapy. So this patient clearly would be in the low risk category and low, low, low risk because it's not even metastatic or, or it's metastatic in one node. It wouldn't be, it wouldn't fall into a high risk and we I don't think we have the evidence yet from any of the studies to give this patient chemotherapy and hormonal therapy at this time. All right. Any final comments, and then we'll uh, turn it over to the kidney panel. Yes, Mark. I would just, in line with what uh, Howard said uh, earlier, say that we as radiation oncologists see this subgroup of patients as different from patients with metastatic disease. The patient with 
uh, bony metastatic disease is incurable, then you can discuss whether you will get hormones, hormones with chemotherapy. We all know as radiation oncologists that there is a subset, small but nevertheless clearly defined, subset of patients with uh, uh, metastasis even in the paraortic area you can cure with local therapies. So giving up on that to me is giving up on the only option to still be curative. That he has high risk, we all recognize he has an early rise of the PSA, we all understand that, but I wouldn't give up on the possibility to treat in addition to whatever is given to give I mean, the I radiation. Think, yeah, I think the point here, though, is that with standard imaging, he had no metastatic disease. With better PET-based imaging, and this is still clearly not the best PET scan we're going to have, he had, uh, he, had, he had nodes that really were much higher, you know, above where we usually consider prostate cancer to go, except for in the widely metastatic setting. He actually had three three clear nodes positive. Anyways, thank you very much for this uh, great discussion, and we'll turn it over to the, uh, the kidney panel. Uh, Will.